Uh, good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from our colleague Gil Patterson. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the EU environmental and animal welfare principles. We are joined by Amy Hill of Client Earth, uh, Richard Leslie in his role as co-convener of the Scottish branch of the UK Environmental Law Association, and Professor Gavin Little, Professor of Environment and, Environmental and Public Law at the University of Stirling. Uh, I should say we were to have been joined by a representative of the Law Society of Scotland, um, but they are unable to attend due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will just move to questions. Um, I'll kick this off. Can I ask each of you in, in turn what you believe would be the effect of relying on the inclusion of environmental principles in international law post-Brexit and how those could be enforced? Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, the, I should say, first of all, that uh, the, the paper that uh, I submitted was co-authored with Dr. Annalisa Savarese, who couldn't be here uh, today, unfortunately, and she is uh, an international law uh, expert. Um, I'm a, a domestic uh, governance uh, specialist, uh, and so my working, I have a working knowledge of, uh, of international aspects, but I wouldn't claim to be uh, to have expertise in it. I mean, I think that uh, if we um, imagine ourselves in, in, in the Brexit situation, uh, the simple answer would be that Scotland would be continued to be, and Scottish ministers and uh, Scottish government would continue to be subject to international law obligations that uh, include the environmental principles. And that would be the case if it was either treaty law um, and there are a number of treaties, of course, which, uh, which do uh, involve, the, uh, involve different uh, principles. And it would also be the case uh, in terms of international customary law. Richard Leslie, do you want to come in on this? I think that uh, after Brexit, the principles will remain unless repealed. So, uh, and at some future stage, we may go back into Europe, so there may well be an opportunity for us to keep, retain the principles. But beyond that, I don't have any other comment. Okay. Amy Hill. Uh, yeah, I'll just add a, a quick addition. I think uh, one of the issues with the principles sitting solely in international law uh, is the ease with which citizens and civil society um, can hold decision makers accountable to them. Uh, and so, Echoing what um, others have said, they're still client Earth is still quite concerned that there be a place for them in domestic law, uh, so that they continue to be more accessible and more applicable in the domestic context rather than in a state-to-state -state kind of context. Okay, let's move this along. Uh, John Scott. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, so, just on following on and from the convener's question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of placing environmental principles on a statutory footing? And is this In terms of the advantages, I mean, one, uh, one advantage is, I think, quite clearly that we have been uh, subject to en environmental principles via EU law uh, for some decades. And so if we were to uh, imagine ourselves in a Brexit situation where that was no longer the case, that would be quite a significant change um, and that could impact adversely in terms of the, 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 the certainty and clarity which attaches to uh, the way in which we we make environmental law arrive at environmental policy. Um, so I think that you know we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have been and are at the moment uh, subject uh, to the environmental principles through EU law. And so therefore, um, as we embark on Brexit, we need to we th think, I think, uh, 
um, quite clearly about uh, how we ensure continuity with that. Um, continuity perhaps be there in terms of elsewhere in, in, in other parts of international law there are similar environmental principles outside? Not, not I think to the same degree or to the same extent. Um, and I think what the, the, the environmental principles are not uh, of course uh, EU principles. Uh, they, are, they are principles that are, I think, common to any developed system of, of environmental governance, environmental law. But what is true, I think, to say is that the EU has developed these principles uh, to a very high uh, uh, degree by comparison with other, uh, with other jurisdictions and other legal structures. And we are currently part of that. Um, so I think that w what we need to be... Uh, alive to is the, is the possibility that Brexit is going to take us uh, from being perhaps uh, without necessarily thinking that much about it uh, in a position where we, we are subject to really quite a developed idea of what environmental principles are all of a sudden to being one where we're not. Uh, and that I see is, is a potential uh, issue in terms of ensuring continuity and certainty and clarity in the way that we approach environmental governance. Thank you. Do you have others want to comment or, or not? I think some of the, the principles are already enshrined in, in many of our statutes. Uh, for example, in the contaminated land regime, we have the concept of the polluter pays, that we look out to find out who caused the pollution, and they have to then pay for the cl cleanup. Uh, we also have the preventative action or precautionary principle in the fact that we have to have environmental impact assessments for big developments. So these principles are already sitting behind or <coughs> enshrined in our legislation. We, we already use these principles. Amy? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. They, um, they are general concepts, and although they're not sort of silver bullets and the only important thing in environmental law, they do provide sort of a benchmarking standard and have been used by EU policymakers and decision makers and courts and indeed Scottish uh, policymakers and decision makers and even Scottish courts, although less, less frequently. Um, and so they definitely provide something extra as a, as a benchmark and an and a overarching set of goals that will drive in a certain direction. So in the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, where the EU principles are currently set out, uh, it prefaces the, the list in Article 1912 with um, the, the fact that those principles are aimed at a high level of environmental protection. And so I think um, Professor Eloise Scottford actually has written on this. Um, she, she sees them as working together sort of as a unit and um, as quite a coherent list. So they, you'll often see them used together in environmental directives in the EU. So for example, the Water Framework Directive uh, references the prevention principle, the polluter pays, um, and the principle of remediating environmental damage at source, and sort of uses them as a grouping to, to develop an approach to, to controlling environmental damage and, and protecting the environment. Um, their general nature does mean that they can apply in a, in a nuanced way in different circumstances. And so that could be seen as a, an advantage in that, you know, government can perhaps provide um, policy direction in partic particular contexts for how they, it sees, say, the precautionary principle applying to chemicals. Um, but we still have these benchmarking overall um, and agreed principles that guide environmental law. Concerned, forgive me, convener. I'm concerned that the Law Society have some reservations about this. Did you co author the evidence with the Law Society professor Little? Um, you, did, you didn't? No. no, forgive me, I misunderstood that then. But no. specifically, the Law Society say that a principle may be incapable of being legally enforced due to a lack of certainty as to how it applies in a particular situation and how it interacts with more specific provisions of substantive law. Directly enacting principles in legislation is generally not an effective way of lawmaking unless a subsidiary role is made clear and there is no instance of principles being relied upon in place of sufficiently precise legal rules being developed. They go on. But 
uh, there's huge um, scepticism throughout the Law Society's evidence. And is that a scepticism you share? It's not a scepticism I, I, I share, no. I think that the environmental principles uh, do, as has just been said, they do provide uh, an important big-picture narrative um, and, and an overarching set of uh, ideas on how to approach what's often a very complex and fragmented uh, regulatory uh, area. And I think that having them on a statutory footing or having them uh, in the, the EU treaties, as they currently are, it does ensure that they're not overlooked in policy making uh, and, and, and implementation and decision taking uh, and in the exercise of, of discretion. Um, and I think it also can uh, guide uh, statutory interpretation. So I do take the point, I mean, I think what the Law Society is, is saying is, 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 seems to me to be quite a narrow issue um, because I think that the, the extent to which um, the environmental principles have legal effect depends on if they are put into statute on how they're put into statute. So, for example, if you have a, a statutory provision including the uh, environmental principles which explicitly states the courts may and shall use the environmental uh, the, the, the principles in uh, statutory interpretation or the, the environmental principles may be viewed as a standard uh, for, for decision takers then and, and uh, the court uh, should have uh, uh, cognizance of that then clearly in that context they can be quite uh, significant and muscular um, uh, elements. It's a great shame that the gentleman from the Law Society sadly cannot be with us, but uh, he specifically says we do not consider that there will be a need to expressly incorporate principles into the statute book. I think what they're trying to say here is that they don't want to have a specific statute where the principles are enshrined in Scots law where they would prefer to have them is in specific areas of law. And we've already mentioned the, the, the water framework directive we have in the water uh, uh, legislation that a polluter will pay. And you have to pay, if you are going to discharge to water, you have to obtain a consent, you pay. Um, if you, and I think the Law Society's view is that it should be a case-by-case -case, uh, piece that we should have cognizance. Ukela, who I represent, would say we'd want to have these as general binding guidelines, just as we have a national planning framework that we have these sitting behind and that legislators would have to take into account the principles when looking at legislation on a specific point, but the principles themselves would not be in, in statute. Right, so they're not two irreconcilable positions then. Thank you. Okay, can I, um, before coming back to John Scott, who's got further questions, uh, Finlay Carson followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Convener. I hope you'll indulge me for a second. It's, it's just a, a very quick question, but I can't miss the opportunity to have three experts in front of me without asking it. Um, local authority, polluters must uh, pay. Um, prior to local authority reorganisation, if a district um, council was to pollute and that council was then incorporated into a, a larger regional council, can the original council still be held responsible as a polluter? So um, this is a, an excellent example of how sometimes the, these principles feel intuitively very easy and can obviously things can get quite complex. Um, I can't speak to the specific legal you know, Scottish situation there in terms of the analysis, but um, the polluter pays principle, though it does run into issues sometimes with identifying a polluter. Um, it does have its limits. Uh, for example, you might, there might be a sound policy reason why you might not always want the polluter to pay. For example, if uh, a government was trying to put in place some kind of insurance, encourage an insurance regime around, say, the movement of a particularly hazardous substance, if they wanted to make sure there was insurance in place available to companies doing that if there were a spill, so that we could be sure that there was no kind of environmental damage that left unremediated because a company was in liquidation or you know didn't have the assets or things like that, then you can conceive of a situation where a government may wish to, say, cap liability, which isn't a strict application of the polluter pays, but might therefore encourage insurers to provide insurance for a particular thing. So I think... There's always going to be intricacies in, in applying these principles um, to particular contexts, but I think that's where um, government decisions and, say, 
a policy guidance document accompanying, say, a list of the principles in statute would be helpful because government can turn its mind and parliament can turn its mind to those issues, um, to have more detailed direction uh, in terms of particular instances and how those principles will apply. Um, but that principle would also be uh, obviously used in a court in, alongside you know, remediation at source and things like that to you know, guide the approach to a contaminated land issue. Sorry. Sorry. Would it not be the case we have to look at the local government acts and see what obligations and responsibilities were taken on by the new authority, just as there would be other responsibilities and obligations in terms of social care, etc. And I would have thought that the, any liabilities that the former authority had would be passed on to the new authority depending on the council area that they were in. And so if there was... Uh, landfill which was incorrectly disposed of, my guess, and we'd have to look at the legislation, would be that the new authority would take on that liability and would have to deal with the remediation under the polluter principle uh, pays um, scenario, unless you can find somebody else who did it. Um, now, under that, uh, if you cannot trace the polluter, often it then falls to the landowner to remediate. And if the land is then owned by that new local authority, then I'm afraid the, the, the cost would have to be borne by that, uh, that landowner. Uh, if it was causing harm, I mean, there's a, uh, we have to look at and, and see. If it's just sitting there not doing anything, it's, in a, it's cased in a landfill site, not, not escaping, then, then perhaps nothing needs to be done. Mark Ruskin, can I come back to what you were speaking about earlier, Amy Hill? I hear what you say about the application of the principles, but I wonder about, isn't there a, a very queer deterrent effect of having the principles very much enforced, uh, uh, enshrined? Because the likelihood, I would have thought, would be that for someone who's considering polluting because they're playing fast and loose with the environment, the knowledge that you will be pursued because of the existence of these principles in itself may have a behavioural effect. Yeah, absolutely, and sorry, perhaps I was unclear earlier. I think the, that is one of the strengths of the polluter pays principle and one of the reasons why it's, um, it has developed um, to deter as well as to ensure that their remediation is done. Um, and so, yeah, it, it would have a deterrent effect and it will flow. The strength of all of these principles is also how they f it flows into more detailed legal rules and, you know, we see how the polluter pays principle flows into detailed legal rules in the contaminated land regime. Crossco. Um, what's your thoughts on how the principles have now been incorporated into the Scottish Parliament's continuity bill? Um, we had quite a few discussions around the nature of the principles, whether they should be seen as general principles for enshrining in the legislation or whether they should be there as guiding principles to inform future legislation. And I think we ended up perhaps more on, on the guiding principles side of things, perhaps taking account of some of the, the concerns that the, the Law Society have expressed in their written submission. But I just wonder what, 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 what's your thought on where we ended up with that? Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the clause, which I, I'm assuming was had to be put together extremely quickly uh, in, in the circumstances, um, is, uh, is actually, in many ways, a solid, very solid uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and the reason I say that is because um, it does uh, obviously state them actually in legislation. Uh, I think that uh, it's better, myself, this is my own view, it's better not to be too prescriptive or specific uh, about what they are um, they should just, just be referred to in the terms that they are, and, uh, which is, I think, in some respects, similar to the, uh, the uh, provision in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, so I think there's benefit in that. I think that the one observation that could be made about it is that it is very much targeted on Scottish ministers. And so it's not an attempt to uh, establish a more general duty. Um, which could, uh, could apply to other uh, public authorities or perhaps to other selected uh, public authorities. Um, it also, I think, and something that it does, which is important, I think, is that it clearly links uh, 
the Scottish Parliament's ideas of what environmental principles are, the environmental principles are with the European Union provision. And I think that that's important because, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, um, the, we, we've been part of the EU regime for decades. Um, and so therefore we are contiguous to, the, to that uh, regime in, in, I suppose, cultural terms, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, our approach to what the law is and, and how it should be, uh, how it should be uh, implemented and used uh, in the environmental context. So I think that sticking quite close to the EU uh, provision uh, is, uh, I think, the right thing to do. I don't think that um, we should be thinking in terms of trying to develop uh, a Scottish, a specifically Scottish or specifically UK view on what those principles might mean. Yeah, I, I would say the guidelines uh, scenario as well. Okay. Okay. So, like Stuart Stevens wants to come in briefly. Uh, I just wanted to make a contribution in the light of the question Finlay Carson, because it's taken me a minute to find it. Under the uh, a Local Government Scotland Act 1994, Section 15.2, um, transfer of all rights, liabilities and obligation of an existing local authority on 1st of April 1996, such new authority or authorities. In other words, they continue to exist across the reorganisation. They merely are now with different bodies. And I thought just to avoid that one running away from us, it would be useful to get it in the record, convener. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, witness evidence, Mr Stevenson. <laughs> uh, Amy Hill, did you wish to come back on that point? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, only to say that um, I would agree also with what Professor Little has said and Client Earth has been uh, campaigning for the inclusion of these environmental principles um, in the EU withdrawal bill uh, in Westminster and is, was very pleased and encouraged to see them in the Scottish continuity bill. Um, I would echo that uh, Client Earth would um, hope that the principles would be applicable to all public authorities rather than just government ministers. Uh, but the, we also agree that uh, I think simply listing them in statute and then perhaps following up with a, a more detailed policy document that sat alongside would be better than uh, potentially including some sort of rigid definition in, in statute. So, yeah. Okay. Mr Scott. Thank you. I think to some extent the questions have been answered. So what are the alternative options to putting the principles into Scots law? Just what you're saying, really, in grouping them in, in terms of guidance and having them sitting behind the law. Is that, have I understood that correctly? Right. Yes. And what, Richard, please, we oh, sorry, forgive me. Can, can I add that if we enshrine them into Scots law, we, our public authorities have a number of other environmental duties and there may be a clash if we put this in as well. And if I just read out what some of these other duties are, uh, public authorities have a, a, an obligation to um, look after the natural heritage, look after biodiversity under the Nature Conservation Scotland Act. They've got climate change targets and sustainability, and that's an obligation in terms of the cha Climate Change Scotland Act and the requirements of the Habitats Directive. So they have a number of... Uh, obligations already, and if we, we introduce new obligations, there could be conflict between the two, as we've seen with wind farms. Macro, we've got renewable energy. Micro, it's not a, a good site. And it may be an opportunity for Scottish Parliament to look at which ones get priority, or, or are there too many obligations on public authorities? Should we streamline them? But that's perhaps a, a, for another day. Yeah. Well, no, for another question, my colleague will just yeah. come on to that in a moment in terms of hierarchy yeah. of, of competing demands and principles. My final question to you, but thank you for your answer to that one, was uh, what, would the, what would be the consequence of having different approaches across the United Kingdom in terms of priorities and of competing principles? Well, I, I think that um, in the areas that are very clearly devolved, um, it should be a matter for the Scottish Parliament as to whether or not 
it wishes to have uh, principles in legislation, irrespective of the position which we understand is going to be taken south of the border, where there is going to be no statutory uh, provision for them. I suppose the, the difficulty could arise, or difficulties could potentially arise, um, in those areas where there is a shared interest, if you like, the crossover areas. The marine environment, moorland environment, uh, cross border. Indeed. So, so Indeed. But you think, well, would this not be an opportunity for frameworks or overarching frameworks? I mean, I appreciate it's not yet resolved, but you think it should be a matter for Scotland and as we say in Scotland, do uh, take the hindmost as far as others are concerned in other parts of the United Kingdom? Well, I, I think that um, if Scotland chooses to uh, have a particular position whereby it seeks to put um, the environmental principles into statutory form, because that is felt to be uh, in the Scottish public interest and it's within a devolved area, then I, I, I think that the Scottish Parliament should do that. There may be issues arising from that, but... Okay. Uh, Donald Cameron. Sorry. 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 Sorry, Tom. Could I answer that? We understand that in England, DEFRA proposes an independent statutory body to champion and uphold environmental standards. And we wonder if Scotland should either appoint its own body to look at uh, environmental standards or should explore with the UK and other devolved authorities the ways of enabling environmental oversight. So it's joined up. And there will be occasions, for example, animal welfare, when we are trading with other nations, where we do have to have this joined up thinking. We cannot simply go our own way if it's a, a UK imposition, uh, although our law may be different because there are now opportunities for us to, to have our own environmental law. So we want to make sure that the principles already established in Scotland aren't watered down by the other jurisdictions, though. There's this non regression policy, that we don't want to make our environmental policies weaker or watered down simply because we're now going to trade, for example, with the United States or Brazil, as opposed to the European Union. And we have to be careful and it's be useful to have a, a, a body that champion it and saying, well, that is, that's a backward step. Oh, yes, thank you. Right, yeah. Amy? Yeah. Um, the client earth uh, would be very keen, if at all possible, for there to be some sort of co-designed, co-owned, UK-wide framework, obviously respecting um, the devolved settlements. Um, and one model uh, which we're sort of looking at at the moment, which might possibly provide a framework, uh, could be the Marine Policy Statement, which I understand is co-designed and uh, co-owned with mechanisms for, I believe, uh, if one devolved administration at some point doesn't wish to continue to be uh, jointly working on the marine policy statement, I think they can drop away, but the statement will remain and apply in the remaining jurisdictions. So if it, if it were possible, um, we think there would be advantages to a, a UK-wide framework of some sort. But why, when uh, you could, in theory, run the risk of a lowering of standards? So mainly because there are things like the marine environment which are, are joined up or, you know, national climate change uh, targets. Obviously, some environmental issues are more localised and, and if it were to result in a lowering of standards, that wouldn't be preferable. Um, but there are some... Is that? Yeah, maybe a political will issue if you're working cross-border or, yeah, or, mm. you know, or allowing governments to have that as a baseline but go above and beyond yes. in their mm. own jurisdictions, you know, okay. not limiting upwards. Okay. Um, Would you like to develop that theme? Because that's the question I wanted to ask you in that regard. I mean, there might be a baseline, a, a minimum standard, so to speak, and what others, if they wanted to go beyond that, could improve on it. Yes. And, and is, that a, is that a tenable position? Perhaps if Scotland want to have better or different standards, yeah. but there is a, an overarching framework and then you move to an enhanced position if that's what we perceive we want to do in Scotland. I, I think that would be tenable. Um, there are, it's already sort of quite frequently seen in areas of EU law. Um, you know, governments, member states no, are allowed to improve and I think as a general principle, 
the other way is not <laughs> not acceptable. But um, if there were an agreed UK-wide baseline and Scotland wished to improve upon it, then that would be. Okay. I don't think we already have that. that in terms of the Climate Change Act. We have far tougher targets in Scotland than they do for the UK. So it's no different. We could we could impose the same for Scotland. A development of an existing principle. Right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Donald Cameron at last. Thank you, Kavina. Um, sorry, can I refer to my register of interest as a practicing advocate? Um, can I ask, uh, these, my questions touch on what the convener and, and the deputy convener have, have also asked you about, um, and that is Brexit and so international obligations. And the, I think the most obvious example of this is the Aarhus Convention, which is, of course, a UN uh, document. Um, and it enshrines important principles such as access to information, uh, public participation in decision making, and, and access to justice. Um, after Brexit, uh, this will persist. And I just, I suppose, if you can sort of um, look into the future, as it were, do you see that being an opportunity for us to raise standards or realistically are we going to see a lowering of standards? What, what do you think will happen? Richard Leslie. Donald, it's a, it's a question of political will, ultimately. We've had this debate, should we have environmental courts? And there hasn't been an appetite or, or there hasn't been the funding for it. My concern is that Scotland being a fairly small jurisdiction, do we have the, 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 the manpower to, to deal with this, to have that? Or do we then follow the lead in the rest of the UK? But our house would, would, would continue beyond that and will be developed by our courts rather than by our politicians, although politicians have an opportunity to do something about it. I mean, on going to the question that's just been asked, on something like access to justice, which you know, there is a healthy debate as to whether um, Scottish courts or Scots law is, is, is um, allowing that principle or, or to the extent to which that principle is, is being realised. Um, if there is a divergence between the devolved administrations of the UK, could you see, for example, Scotland allowing greater access to justice in environmental cases than other forums in the UK? I think potentially, yes. Um, I, I agree internally that it's a, a matter of, of political will, ultimately, um, and resource. Um, and it also, I suppose, if it touches on something which I, I know has been raised before the, the committee in the past, and that is that in a post-Brexit situation, we may well find ourselves in a situation where um, environmental issues are far more politicised at a local level and there may well be very much more in the way of, say, for example, lobbying activity here in this parliament and of the Scottish government. And that too could be quite a, a profound uh, influence in this sort of dynamic. Thank you. Can I probably betray my lack of legal understanding in asking this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because this is all about what applying these principles would look like in future. So quite recently, this committee concluded that the precautionary principle, there was little evidence of it having been deployed in relation to aquaculture expansion. Now, I recognise there are contrary views to that. But how do we get to a setup in future that ensures that government or its agencies don't ignore such principles, can't ignore such principles, and must pay heed to them. What would be the best setup going forward to get us into that position? I, um, what Client Earth proposes uh, is to have the principles listed in, in statute and with accompanying policy guidance, and then with some clear duties on public authorities to have regard to them or possibly act in accordance with the policy statement, some, something along those lines. Um, and a lot of the success of some of those uh, statutory duties comes down also, though, to political will. Um, you know, there's an example that I have recently come across. There's a um, fisheries, there's an act to do with fisheries from 1993, which only has one clause or two clauses and says that all authorities um, and that are making fisheries management decisions should do so, taking into account wildlife conservation. Um, I don't think that has been particularly 
um, influential or effective. Uh, but then you see sometimes they are, for example, the counterterrorism prevent duty is similar statutory wording taken very seriously. So a lot of it is political will and, and developing practices that um, you know, routinely pick up the principles document, have a flick through, have a think about it, um, consider it, and you know, build that up that way. Go on. I think another, um, adding to that, um, a statute which, which um, sets out the principles could also, uh, and, and makes them applicable to, say, public authorities, um, could also have a reporting requirement um, where the authorities are required to report on a, on a regular basis. Um, there could also be a provision for uh, information on specific decisions which have been arrived at by authorities um, to be provided, say, for example, to, to this parliament. Um, so there are a range of things that one can do that would, would uh, I suppose, channel um, decision takers uh, down a particular line, say, if we're thinking about the precautionary principle, that they, they, they should, as a matter of course, consider precautionary issues. Now, it might be, of course, in, in, in depending on the situation, that they would consider the precautionary principle and decide that precautionary action wasn't appropriate in that case, which I think is, is, it would, would not be unreasonable at all, depending on the circumstance. Um, but the important thing, uh, it would seem to me, is that there would be a requirement to report on that and, if necessary, to provide reasons, uh, not only to, the, to, to this parliament, but also uh, publicly, that should be transparently done. That's very interesting, Richard Leslie. I think in terms of aquaculture, because you mentioned it, you, you may want to look at the consenting regime to see whether changes could be made to that, that they do take into account the precaution principle, because there is a, a question mark as to what the longer-term effects are uh, going forward. Okay, thanks. Let's move this on. Richard Lyle. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, some people actually have strayed into my question, so I'll, I'll try and rephrase it slightly. But it's been suggested that further consideration should be given to uh, as to whether additional principles should be included in Scots law. Colin Reid, Professor of Environmental Law at University of Dundee, proposed that a non-regression principle should be introduced which would propose that any changes in law or policy should maintain or increase the level of environmental protection and not allow any deterioration. Therefore, can I ask the panel, should other principles, such as the non-regression principle, be incorporated into Scots law ahead of Brexit? Stunned. Uh, it certainly could be, and I can see that there are, there are strong arguments uh, for, for doing so. I think that um, the inclusion of uh, a principle of that sort, its, its value would, I think, primarily be as a sort of baseline uh, for decision takers. Um, and again, it's something which could usefully be reported on uh, by decision takers. Uh, but it certainly it's one of those things, one of those uh, criteria for decision takers, which sits well with the, uh, the other principles. Um, I suppose, I mean, I, I know that later on there's perhaps going to be some discussion of, of hierarchy of principles. I mean, one thing that we haven't really touched on is the possibility or the, the potential for having the principles which are in uh, Clause 13b of the Continuity Bill made subject to a, a more general objective of pursuing a sustainable environment. Uh, if you had a principle of that sort introduced, then arguably the requirement for a non-regression principle might fall away to some extent. So I think there's certainly a debate to be had around uh, the inclusion of, of that principle and, and other principles, but it would need to be worked out quite carefully, so that they're, they're rational, they work in a rational way together. Okay, anyone else want to come in on that? Can I ask you a, a follow-up well, we'll um, Do you want to come back on that specific point, and then we'll, Mr Loyal can follow up. Anybody else? I think we just have to be slightly careful that we don't create a stick to beat ourselves with in the future. There may be good reason why laws have to be changed. So whilst non-gression might be a principle, I wouldn't necessarily want to see it put into statute. We, we don't know 
who in the future would come along and say, well, that's a, a regression and it becomes very subjective. Um, uh, so. Actually, you must have seen my, my second question, Mr. Leslie. But basically, I'm, like uh, Finlay Carson, uh, I, can't, I can't pass up the opportunity to ask you this. In your opinion, on leaving the EU, do we need to review, update, or accept every law passed by the EU since we joined, or just accept these laws entirely, in your view? Quick general point. Um, I think initially it's very important that there's no loss, from climate Earth's perspective, no loss of environmental protections. And so initially that would be about retaining and then hopefully improving upon, but um, we certainly wouldn't want to lose anything that's currently in EU law. Um, I would agree with that. I'd also observe that um, the UK has very often been a major driver of large parts of EU environmental law. Uh, and. So I, th I think it would be very much a retrograde step if we were to take that course. And the Great Repeal Bill simply retains all existing legislation. So it's up to individual parliaments to legislate if they want to change that. So from day one, we will be accepting everything that we've previously accepted. And most of our Europe uh, environmental law is derived from Europe, Habitats Directive, Water Framework Directive, et cetera. So the, I, th I think we're in a good, a good footing and I don't see any need for change unless there's a specific I I need to do that. Thank you. Um, Mark Croskill and John Scott. Yeah, th thanks, Kavim. Uh, I was just looking back at a, an answer to a written question uh, on this principle of non-regression and, and how we keep pace. And I think, to summarise, the Scottish Government's um, response to this is that the mechanisms that have been put into the continuity <coughs> bill as it sits at the moment, um, they believe to be adequate. So that's the you know, enshrining of the, of the guiding principles and the keeping pace provisions, as you've already mentioned, under um, Section 13, and, uh, and the duty to consult on a, on a governance structure going forward. Does that, what, what's your view on that? I mean, if you take that alongside the political commitment, the current administration to, to keep pace with EU laws, is, is that effectively non-regression or? Or uh, perhaps, as Professor Little was saying, we need to go further, perhaps, within the keeping pace provisions? Or, I don't know, does that reassure you that that, that effectively is non-regression? I think that it is, in the vast majority of cases, it would likely to, to be just that, yes. Um, I think the point I was making about a, a broader overarching principle of uh, uh, sustain. Uh, pursuing a sustainable environment, having that as a key objective, um, was uh, more uh, aimed at the idea of trying to make the, uh, the, the provision for the principles more coherent, rather than necessarily saying that if, if, if that provision wasn't there, it would, it would result in a, in, a, in a serious regression. Quickly add, um, I think, yeah, the, um, I won't speak on the details of the Scottish bill, but I think the government's approach is not to regress um, in terms of its bringing EU law into, into UK and Scots law. Um, I think where a non-regression principle might be useful is, say, 10 years in the future as, as we develop our, our law independently, um, provided the UK doesn't end up back in somehow, <laughs> anything like that. Um, and then, you know, ben benchmarking uh, as, as law reform happens, you know, domestically. We also don't know what the future of Euro Euro Europe is going to be. And that they may change, they may regress. And it's important that we don't necessarily simply keep step with European law. We very much look after our own. And we've already mentioned aquaculture, where we are very different to the rest of the UK, which doesn't have a big sample salmon fish farming industry. So I think we'd, we, we, we do want to keep a, an independent line and not necessarily always follow Europe, especially if they go backwards. Thank you. Okay, uh, John Scott. Oh, thank you, convener. And, and just to take you back to, as it were, the, the broader picture of a hierarchy of, of principles, 
in this regard, um, the Law Society have said to pick out specific principles and give them special status, which goes beyond that currently applying, runs the risk of unintentionally giving the principles a greater status than other relevant principles. Now, Richard Leslie spoke of rods to beat our own backs with. Is that the sort of thing you mean? And, and therefore, what would you suggest in terms of the reference of this committee, environmental stuff by and large, and I should have declared an interest earlier, well, I'm doing that now, um, but in, in how, what would you suggest a hierarchy should look like, perhaps, if where there were to be such a hierarchy? I think one thing that it should not be is set out in statute. It should not be set out in statute okay. if, if such a hierarchy was to be developed. So one could have a statutory provision, as say in, in Clause 13b, but the issue of how those uh, principles are addressed by decision takers is something that can be, can be, can be dealt with as a matter of policy. And so any, any view on how a hierarchy might be established would be a, a matter of policy rather than something which you would necessarily want to set out in statute. In fact, I can see, you know, under the, under the law of unintended consequences, uh, setting it out in statute uh, could potentially be quite, uh, quite a, a risky step to take. Um, so you're going, almost going to say it would be a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, others share that view? I, I don't think there is currently a hierarchy of these principles, and I don't see why we need to have a hierarchy that they will all sit together to be looked at in the round. Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear. Thank Thanks you. very much. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks. Um, can I turn to the issue of um, trade and, and trade <coughs> deals and um, the way that principles may or may not um, have an impact or, or, or otherwise on, on trade deals? Um, I think you've, uh, Richard Leslie, I think you've already touched on this, but um, can we just get some more thoughts on how this may play out? I think it's going to be difficult. We've got the UK government who's going to be uh, responsible for trade deals with other countries. On the radio this morning, Liam Fox was saying that the UK would have its own standards. Uh, we're talking about importing chicken from the United States of America, which is currently not allowed. Uh, there, so there may be pressure put on, on the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish, Scottish government, to look at the wider UK picture. Um, and in those, in those circumstances, there may be regression. Um, and we may have to look at our own farmers and our own producers in, in these, these items. Um, and stick to, after all, the environment is a devolved subject. We don't have to agree to UK uh, standards. Any, any thoughts? Uh, as they're currently enshrined in, in the continuity bill, having an impact then on the negotiation of, of any UK uh, trade deal? Not necessarily. Is, is the answer to that, because I suppose the position would be that uh, the UK government would also be uh, con considering these uh, environmental principles, but would be viewing them solely as uh, policy principles. The Scottish uh, authorities would be looking at them because they have a legal obligation uh, because, they, because they're in statute, rather, not a legal obligation, but they are, they are there in statute, and so therefore they would consider them for that reason. It doesn't necessarily mean that they would take a different view on how the principles are to be interpreted in an instant case. Uh, yeah, I think we would see them as um, perhaps informing the government's approach to its trade policy, and um, Client Earth would hope that the UK government continues to sort of push for high environmental standards and, um, you know, environmental protections in its international relations and, and trading, and perhaps having these as the as this domestic background could inform that. I, the principles don't, from my limited understanding of trade agreements, don't tend to feature in trade agreements themselves, um, although they are increasingly having environmental chapters and things like that now. Um, Michelle Barnier spoke of a non-regression 
uh, clause in a future free trade agreement. Uh, I think that's conceptually quite different to having a domestic non-regression clause, which is about uh, our, our environmental standards domestically. That that's about actually competition, trade competition, you know, and I think Barnier sees it as making sure that the UK doesn't undercut the EU by lowering its standards. So it's sort of a different thing in, in the trade context, I think, and, that, and it's, a, it's a tool for that, yeah. I mean, could future trade agreements prevent the Scottish Parliament putting environmental principles into Scots law at a, at a future date? I'm not an expert in international trade. Um, I'm more of a, a domestically focused specialist. But on the face of it, I, I can't see how they would prevent the Scottish Parliament from passing legislation uh, that would apply to devolved areas, um, particularly if it's a, a, it's a fairly general, non-specific uh, provision of the sort that's in Clause uh, 13B of the Continuity Bill. Because the issue is not so much um, whether or not these principles are considered in decision taking. The issue would be what the decision actually was in terms of how they should be applied. So just in, in terms of that then, um, I mean that would suggest that some form of, a, of an impact assessment around a particular trade deal would need to be uh, produced that would then enable you know, uh, citizens and, and devolved administrations and others to, to really look at at the impact and about how the principles have been applied. What, what would be your, your view on that? With a, you know, how should the principles kind of inform, if you like, an impact assessment around a, a, a trade deal and any subsequent consultation? Are there particular issues that you could? Well, uh, I, I suppose um, there could be uh, debates around issues of, of public health, depending on, on particular trade deals. Um, food standards, uh, things of that nature, where uh, it, if we take, for example, GMOs as an example, uh, we are currently at the moment subject to a strongly precautionary regime. Um, if we fall out of the EU uh, and we're still wishing to apply a strongly precautionary uh, regime in, in uh, the Scottish context but find ourselves unable to do so because of, uh, because of a trade deal, then that would, at the very least, I think, initiate uh, quite a considerable uh, debate uh, in Scotland about what the nature of the precautionary principle is and, and how we view it. Yeah. Any other thoughts on um, how we assess the impacts of trade deals using the principles at all? No. OK. Yeah, Stuart wants to come in. Um, I just wanted to take us to a slightly different view on the whole subject. Um, do the panel agree, first of all, that trade deals are of necessity bilateral? In other words, it is about one country imposing conditions on the other for trade in one of the directions and vice versa. So that the conditions that might be imposed on what will be imported into Scotland are a separate thing from the conditions that we might have to meet to export to someone else. And to, I, I just want to get the nodding heads that agrees that that's the point, um, which I think I did, Camilla. Um, so therefore, in terms of our own production, I'm thinking of food in particular, but it wouldn't just be food, that, that broadly speaking, we are likely to be able to set our own standards in that regard. Uh, although it is possible um, that just for the sake of argument, the United States might require all chickens exported from Scotland to the United States to have gone through a coordination process. Well, so be it. Uh, that wouldn't matter too much to the Scottish consumer. So th th we ought to be able to retain uh, authority over how we do things for ourselves in Scotland. Is there any difficulty with that statement anyone can identify? I think Amy Hill's on the brink of saying something. I don't know if this is quite answering your question. Um, I think, and I'm by no means a trade expert, I should say. Um, I think the, 
Scotland would be free to put whatever standards it, you know, chooses high standards in place or higher standards than other countries, for example. Um, I do a bit of work also in the fisheries context, and one thing that that industry is thinking about at the moment, though, is um, the a divergence from, for example, EU standards will require certification and things like that in the border and the compliance with, sometimes complying with um, the technical requirements of another country or a trading partner can create sort of barriers and that may therefore mean that Scotland wishes to align itself, for example, closely with the EU rules for the sake of removing friction. Um, but I think, yeah, that's all I would add. So, so therefore, in terms of our own production, we will always need to, as a minimum, meet the standards that are the minimum that's acceptable to the trading partner to whom we are exporting. I mean, that is self-evident. So isn't this particular issue for us in this discussion really about what comes into the country? Because, of course, trade deals are a matter for the UK government and the Scottish Parliament has all but zero direct legislative competence in that regard. May have influence, but no legislative competence. So that is where the, 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 the issue is. Um, and, and of course, probably the issue ends up uh, being about origin, labeling of origin, so that people can decide to buy coordinated American chicken if they wish to do so. I wouldn't recommend it, but that's for other people to decide. Um, but they need to know that they're doing so. And it's unclear what our powers might be there. Is that probably a fair thing to say? And that therein lies the difficulty. I think you're right. We've already got, the, we've had this recently with export of salmon to America, which has a, a, a different standard. And we have to then comp either comply or choose not to trade with, with them in terms of, of, of salmon. Uh, and the same will apply where we, where we are bringing something in. Where it's more difficult is something like a genetically uh, modified soya, which comes in as part of something which is, uh, you know, built into a, a, a prepared food, we might not have that ability to stop it at the border of Scotland saying we won't let it in. So I think it's, a, it's going to be a, a difficulty, but I don't think there's an easy answer for that. Is there a, a difficulty, though, in the negotiation of a trade deal in the, the principles <coughs> that we're talking about, I'm not talking about you know, the, the, the conclusions we may come to by applying the principles, but the principles are treated differently in, in different uh, countries and different parts of the world. So, you know, we, we heard in evidence, written evidence, that there's a difference to the US in terms of their application of sound science compared to our application of the precautionary principle. Is that, I mean, is that gap significant enough to create friction and tensions around how principles are considered? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right to say that um, the US, for example, takes a, a very different view of what the precautionary principle means. In a sense, they're, they're cleaving to a more traditional view of risk regulation um, of, the, of the sort that we used to employ in the UK uh, until really the BSE uh, CJD uh, crisis. But I think going back to a point that was made earlier, that certainly as far as the precautionary principle is concerned, this sort of process is likely op to open up um, quite wide-ranging discussion about what we actually mean by the application of the precautionary principle. At the moment, we are very much in an EU uh, tradition, if you like, of, of, of thinking about the precautionary principle. But post-Brexit, we may have to at least have a discussion <laughs> about what it actually means to apply precautionary uh, decision-taking. There's different views, uh, different views exist as to when the precautionary uh, precautionary action should be taken and, and can quite reasonably differ. But in them, so you, what, forgive me, so you're saying there's different interpretations of the precautionary principle in Australia, in New Zealand, in South Africa, to America, not so to much, Britain? Not so much interpretations of it, but different ideas of when precautionary action <coughs> ought to be taken. So, for example, uh, in, in, the, Means. in the United States, um, they would I think still consider themselves to be applying the precautionary principle in relation to, for example, the, the, the regulation of uh, GMOs. Um, however, 
their view of, um, of how risk is to be balanced would differ. But the actual principle itself is the same. But different authorities can quite reasonably have different views of how to balance risk against benefit. If you see what I mean. It's just a, a quick um, comment. Isn't that always going to be the case? I mean, even, you know, that's why in terms of courts and things, which we'll come on to later, but why the precautionary principle is, is sometimes challenged by, um, you know, in judicial review or whatever, because uh, different local authorities with respect may interpret the precautionary principle differently. Uh, so even within, you know, Scotland, let alone Britain, there are going to be differences. I think that's right, and um, I, I suppose the, the the way that we think about the precautionary principle here in Scotland at the moment is very heavily conditioned by the fact that we've been part of a very strong EU culture since the 1990s of precautionary decision taking, and so that is a very powerful influence uh, on us. But um, we we do have to be aware that different um, different trade blocks uh, might well take a different view of what the application of the precautionary principle means in a given situation. Right. Uh, thank you for that. Moving on, Alex Rowley. <laughs> countries and what we can learn for other countries. Um, so as there are countries that include environmental principles in legislation and what can we learn from that? Or are there examples in other countries where environmental principles are included in policy guidance rather than legislation, and how effective are they? Amy Hill. Um, I, I think I would echo what was in a number of submissions about being cautious, uh, treating with a grain of salt how other countries do it, just because the legal culture is always different and the political culture is too. Um, one interesting example, I think, is the recent Trinidad and Tobago um, case study, which uh, is in the client earth um, written submission, but uh, the reason why this might be useful for the committee to think about is because um, Trinidad and Tobago have got uh, environmental principles. This one, this case study is particularly about the polluter pays principle in um, a policy statement, um, which it, all public authorities are under a duty to apply, and the Privy Council has recently considered uh, a case involving that policy statement. Um, and so, you know, the, that might give an indication about how UK courts might, might look at something like that, although it's not in a UK setting. Um, and there, the, the policy statement operated to impact upon how a local authority could charge for water permits, discharge permits. Um, and the Privy Council found that the, the authorities Pre current way of doing things, which was just a flat fixed rate fee, was inconsistent with the polluter pays principle in the policy statement and re required them to go back and reconsider how they levy charges for, you know, discharges. Because it was supposed to be about keeping money aside uh, for the cost of remediation and, and at least giving the auth public authority, um, the Privy Council considered that the polluter pays principle uh, as it was in that policy statement, was also about ensuring the public authority left itself the powers to charge for pollution, you know, to, to levy higher than more of a more flat fee. Oh, sorry. To levy higher than a flat fee if necessary, if a permit holder did pollute. So uh, that's an interesting case study, I think, to, to think about here. Um, I, I think that uh, there are, as, as Amy has just indicated, a number of... Uh, potential examples that we could draw on, but I think we, we also do always have to be very careful about the idea of, of legal transplants, uh, as it were. Yes, we can learn, of course, from the experience of other jurisdictions, but um, we have to be aware that those other jurisdictions are operating in different contexts. So there's different constitutional contexts, different legal contexts, uh, also different socio-economic contexts as well, all of which uh, are, are relevant, I think, if we're thinking about how they could be uh, drawn across over into uh, into the Scottish context. Um, and I suppose I, I come back to a point that I made earlier, which is um, probably the most sort of relevant sort of international um, uh, 
uh, an inverted commas uh, scenario for us to, 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 to continue thinking about is, is the EU. Because we are we're currently still part of the EU, its thinking on environmental principles has absolutely been absolutely fundamental to our own law. We've got a, a huge intellectual and legal contiguity with it, and that's going to continue for some time uh, post-Brexit. So um, I'm, I'm kind of wary about casting the net further afield or much further afield and, look, and saying, well, look at what they do here, look at what they do there, um, because there's a danger that we could introduce inconsistencies into the way that we think about the principles. This is a, a very good line of questioning. Um, and given that the academic community were very quick off the mark when Brexit occurred to, to, to identify the risks that we were facing and, and the potential pitfalls, it, it's presumably someone somewhere in the academic community has been doing such a piece of work looking at environmental principles and how they're applied elsewhere across the globe and looked at how these might be adapted. Are you aware of anybody having done that? There are certainly uh, academics in other jurisdictions who, who obviously do uh, work on um, uh, environmental principles. I'm not aware of any work that's sort of specifically related to uh, what the implications of Brexit might be in that context for, for example, how we could adopt uh, models elsewhere. But no doubt that will come. Um. Well, will you get any further? Okay. Uh, do you want to come back on this, Mr. Leslie? You? That's fine. Okay. Uh, moving on then. Um, uh, Finlay Carson. I mean, uh, a number of written submissions suggested it was important that there was enforcement mechanisms, uh, mechanisms to, to, to ensure that compliance with environmental uh, principles. Um, UK ELA and Link have suggested that, that should be the case, and Client Earth um, wrote that uh, a, a new independent statutory body should be established. Um, can you give me uh, your opinions on what the benefits and the risks are on uh, establishing a UK-wide enforcement body? Uh, speaking to Client Earth's Submission and my, it's a colleague of mine who's doing the majority of the work on that, so I can also send some information afterwards if that would be useful. Um, the benefits that Client Earth sees are um, that when we leave the EU, we're leaving uh, the structures and institutions such as the European Commission, which presently provides sort of a, a watchdog function and, and allows um, member states to be held account, and so. Client Earth would see the watchdog body um, as providing s sort of uh, an enforcement function on public authorities, so perhaps um, being able to review policy practices or conduct investigations um, or, yeah, um, were we to have these principles in place, perhaps um, take complaints or you know act as almost a ombudsman style body and investigate whether it, it did consider that say public authority X had con considered the precautionary approach if not how might it better do that you know um, so we would see that as um, an important function of the commissions and, the, and a, that external um, enforcement function that should be replaced in the UK um, again uh, client earth would like to see this UK-wide, respecting the devolution settlements and co-designed, co um, but I obviously entirely respects the devolution settlements and you know, knows that there are great difficulties at the moment um, getting through those. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, 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 I think that uh, the establishment of any commission would have to, if it was to have any hope of uh, purchase, we would have to be very much drafted in line with the principles of devolution. And of course, whether or not that's possible would depend on, on, on political, uh, on the political sphere. Um, I think it's also uh, possible that there could be an independent uh, Scottish commission established to, to do broadly the same thing in the Scottish context. And indeed, there might well be uh, quite a, uh, a strong weight of, of, of argument behind that, given that uh, the devolution of environment, of environment is, is a fundamental area of, of devolution. 
uh, and one could quite reasonably see uh, areas where uh, Scottish practice and Scottish considerations would, would differ and so therefore a Scottish institution uh, might be appropriate. Rachel Lexon. At, at a local level, of course, if legislation is, is introduced which have these principles within them, for example, it's uh, water or, or, or contaminated land, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency already has an enforcement ability. So we already have a structure there of enforcing environmental principles if they are breached. And there are the usual appeals mechanisms, uh, sanctions, um, and, uh, and the court's uh, process. So th th I wouldn't see anything different there as principles are applied to individual aspects of legislation. It's this macro level of are we adhering to these principles uh, of local authorities, uh, is parliament, that's where the commissioner would, would come in. Yeah. If Claudia Beamish, you want to come in? Thank you. I don't know if that's working. Yes. Yes. Thank you, convener. Um, could I just push this a little further and ask you all about um, what role an independent um, Scottish enforcement agent, agency or body would have? Um, if you look at SEPA, it, 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 you, one could question its independence um, while I respect its work, you know. Um, and how would it relate to Scottish government and public bodies and other enforcement agencies across the UK? And just in answering that, there has been a lot of... Um, consideration by various parties and by Scottish Government um, of the possibility of an environmental court or courts, um, perhaps not dissimilar, in my own opinion, to that of domestic abuse courts. Um, but there, there are a range of models that would be possible. So is that, is that a viable situation? And if so, where would any of you see it, it going in terms of where the final decision making in those courts would be? Would it then have to go to the UK to, or would it, could it stay in Scotland? Obviously it's about political will in a sense, but it's about what works, what could work. I think that there's every reason for it to continue within the Scottish jurisdiction. Um, and I think too that, I mean, there has obviously been a lot of uh, a lot of thought and debate about the issue of, of having a separate uh, environmental court. Um, there is, I suppose, the related question of whether or not the ordinary courts could be made to work uh, more effectively in the environmental context. Um, and so, for example, one could have uh, specialist judges uh, sitting within the ordinary court system. Um, the point that was touched on earlier about the role of, of, of a commissioner perhaps operating uh, rather like an ombudsman. That's a rather different role. And, and clearly, if there was to be a dispute resolution mechanism focused on environment that wasn't uh, solely or narrowly legally based, but was also taking into account broader considerations of uh, injustice through maladministration, then an ombudsman type model uh, could, could be um, uh, could be much more appropriate for many uh, environmental disputes. Um, I think that again, even if it was uh, the commission was, was commissioner was was essentially an ombudsman type figure, then there is every reason why that should again be within the devolved ambit and within a specifically Scottish ambit as well. Every reason? Could you? Uh, expand on that. I, th I think the, 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 the main reason there is that we have a situation where the uh, Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government um, has the lead role on, on issues of nature conservation and environmental protection. And so therefore it falls, uh, even notwithstanding Brexit, it still is a, still a subject area which falls very largely within uh, the devolved boundaries. And so therefore um, there's, uh, I think, prima facie a strong case for saying that the, any dispute resolution mechanism should be uh, essentially part of that devolved structure. Where would you then see any ultimate, before I go on briefly to other panellists, where would you see uh, the, the ultimate court being, you know? Well, I mean, if, if we're talking about um, uh, civil disputes, then one could have uh, a system of appeals and point of law to the Court of Session. Uh, and thereby ultimately to, to the UK Supreme Court. 
All right, thank you. Now, are there comments from other panel members on, on the issue? There has been some debate over time whether we should have a separate environmental court. Uh, for environmental matters, often these are criminal if you're polluting and they go before the sheriff court and uh, the, the procurator fiscal isn't used to dealing with them. They're far used to dealing with usual crimes. And we've seen the, the sanctions the, the, and the fines in Scotland far less than those in other parts of the United Kingdom. And they were thought of as a dedicated environmental court. The environment would be looked after uh, in a better way. But this you know, has, has gone on for some time, and we, no, we are no further forward. I think what uh, Professor Little was saying is that is, is Ombudsman is a, a, a good idea from, a, from this macro level of looking at uh, wide areas. But I don't think we should discount the courts are still the first point of reference. Um, and we shouldn't also discount the fact that third parties have an interest uh, in looking to enforce where there is environmental issues, whether it be fracking or wind farms or w whatever. And I think that should also be look looked at. So it's not just the polluter and the enforcer, the third parties have a, have, should have an interest. I don't think I have anything to add beyond what's said. Right, thank just you. Just going to add that SIPA uh, has, of course, itself recently reformed its enforcement uh, procedures. And so uh, in fairness, to that, we perhaps need to wait and see uh, whether or not they, they are more effective than that they're, they're taken to have been. Uh, and, 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 and so that would take a good couple of years, I think, before we could see, start to see results feeding through in that. Thank you. Uh, the final word to John Scott. Oh, perhaps. Um, thank you. Can I just pick you up on your last point, Mr. Leslie? I mean, are you, did you kind of imply that we're less efficient in the, the way our courts operate in terms of environmental law here in Scotland. I mean, I ask not to make any point at all, but just as a point of information, are we are we needing to up our game? Or, I'm not wanting to tempt you into saying anything awkward, but be grateful for a, a straightforward view. If, if, if you think there are shortcomings, then this is the place to, to tell us, please. I don't think there's a shortcoming in enforcement. I think in some of the penalties and sanctions are less than other, other parts of the United Kingdom. And is that sufficient deterrent for people to stop doing what they're doing? I'm thinking of fly tipping or disposing of tyres or what have you. The fines seem to be less in Scotland than they are in England and Wales. And I think that's, that, that's the general point. Thank you. Yes, I think historically that has, that has definitely been the case. Um, the issue is, I suppose, whether or not the new uh, mechanisms that have been adopted recently will, will have a, a significant effect uh, on, that, uh, on that scenario. In the past, been leading to reduced environmental protection. I think there certainly have been concerns that there has been a sort of regulatory arbitrage, uh, potentially north and south of the border, on issues like fly tipping. Um, but my understanding is that there has been quite determined action by SEPA uh, and, and I think to the Crown Office uh, to try and uh, try and remedy that situation. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's been very useful. Uh, I'm going to suspend for a couple of minutes uh, and then we'll reconvene. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, welcome back uh, to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, agenda item three is subordinate legislation. Uh, we will consider the Loch Caron Urgent Marine Conservation Number Two Order 2017, uh, Urgent Continuation Order 2018, SSI 2018-100. The committee has previously considered instruments relating to the status of Law Caron last year, and I invite any comments uh, from members. Mark Roscoe. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to support this. I'm just, I'd quite like some clarity, though, from the government about why we're moving from a temporary order to a temporary order with the um, eventual end point of a, potentially of a, of a permanent order. Uh, and I noticed that the business regulatory impact assessment has been published for the permanent order. So just some clarity on, on the process and why we're, uh, we're going through temporary orders would be good, because it seems like a very obvious uh, case to be made that we should just move to, to permanent order and protect this important site. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. I, I was just um, very um, encouraged that the um, Marine Scotland Scottish Government acted so quickly, and I think that should um, serve as a warning to anyone who wants to flout the regulations, and also that, that anyone fishing should really be aware of where these places are and make sure that, um, that uh, they don't impinge on protected features. Can I, just following up on that point, it's a very good one, I would say, and, and, and perhaps we should also raise with the government what steps they are taking on the back of what happened at Loch Caron to remind um, fishing interests of their responsibilities to the marine environment. Although what happened here was not illegal at the time, it nevertheless was deeply damaging to the environment. Uh, John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, might it also be worth uh, asking the government just for an update on the situation? Is it stabilised? Has it been retrieved? Is there a betterment of, of the damage that has been inflicted on this site? And not an in-depth investigation, but perhaps they will have some knowledge of how the situation is currently following the imposition of this order. So are we agreed to the points that have been raised by members that we should write to the government on these issues? Uh, have, we, have we agreed that? We, we uh, are, are content that the... Uh, the SSI should pass? Yes. We are indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, at its next meeting on the 8th of May, the committee will hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and from the Minister for UK Negotiations and Scotland's Place in Europe on the EU Environmental and Animal Welfare Principles Inquiry. We'll also hear from the Cabinet Secretary on the advice received from the UK Committee on Climate Change on the forthcoming Climate Change Bill. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session. I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed. <laughs>